My name is Evan Klein. I'm the founder of Satrix Solutions. We are a nearly 15-year customer experience and employee engagement consulting or services firm. Uh, we're working with B2B companies on voice of customer, employee feedback, competitive intelligence, and market research programs. So uh, that's a little bit about me. Uh, Aquia, over to you. Yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you for letting me crash uh, your meetings here um, to talk a bit more about competitive intelligence and sales win loss. Um, but I'm Aquia. I'm a senior product marketing manager at Endela. Uh, if you haven't heard about Endela, I am very happy to tell you a bit more about it. Um, it's a tech talent marketplace that basically connects companies with pre-vetted remote ready technical talent. Uh, we have a huge network of talent that span about six different countries. Um, our network is over 250,000, so a huge amount of scale we have there. And they're skilled across a lot of different technical areas, mainly software engineering and developing, um, cloud, Salesforce, uh, data science, as well as product management and uh, design. So if you have questions about that, there's information here, of course, of both Evan and I. Feel free to reach out. But um, yeah, I'm excited to chat with you more about uh, this topic. Yeah, and we've been, thanks, Aquia, we've been fortunate to work with Andela for about three years now uh, on uh, their sales win loss and their net promoter uh, client relationship survey program. Uh, as uh, as we mentioned, we're going to talk mostly about win loss. And I'll be sort of the, uh, quote, vendor perspective and Aquia uh, practitioner and really how they're using it inside of Andela. Um, you know, just to kick things off uh, conceptually, like you know, think about if you knew everything your competitors were doing or planning, what could you do with that information? Now, you know, of course, what we're going to share today, I'm not suggesting that leveraging these approaches, uh, you're going to get everything on your competitors, right? You're not going to understand everything they're planning or doing. But I will say, uh, doing this for 15 years, I still get surprised to this day about how much detail we're able to uncover for our clients. Uh, some people are just very willing to share a lot of uh, granularity, and, and we're pleased to be able to deliver that uh, level of detail to our clients to help them uh, operationalize that uh, win loss and, and competitive intelligence and uh, ho hopefully accelerate uh, sales win rates. So, if you think about how this uh, insight can be used in different parts of the organization, our clients who are um, you know, really sharing and socializing the insights we deliver broadly are the ones who are uh, maximizing the ROI, mas maximizing the impact. Uh, and so, um, you know, we strongly encourage that everyone in the organization has access to at least some bits and pieces of the competitive intelligence that we're delivering. But certainly if you think about the C-suite, uh, it helps them to better anticipate and prepare for competitive moves, identify gaps or market opportunities, make more educated decisions around you know, important things like investments and priorities, even strategic transactions, plan more effectively for emerging competitors. So those are a few of the ways that C-suite is, is leveraging this, uh, this insight. Sales, of course, understand competitor uh, perceived strengths and weaknesses, improve sales forecasting, build out competitive battle cards, uh, counter fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and ultimately win more competitive deals. So uh, a great uh, asset to the sales team. Marketing, of course, I'm sure we all recognize. Uh, ensure your messaging stands out, differentiate against competitors, find white space, uh, ensure you're present where your competitors are at trade shows, conferences, things of that nature. Uh, hey, share, okay. share a voice, you know, track that. Uh, you can certainly appreciate how product would uh, leverage the insights from competitive intelligence, fine tune roadmap, update pricing and packaging watch for offerings that your target market may find compelling. And then even you know, serve customer success, service and support uh, can uh, benefit from that and in and, and the HR group, right? To highlight the benefits of your culture versus your competitors, monitor who your competitors are hiring. So it really does have application across the organization. Um, you know, let me pause and, and, and take it from the conceptual to sort of a real world environment and bring in Aquia here. And, you know, Aquia, what does Andela see most value from the competitive insights that you guys acquire? How are you using it? Yeah, we're using it in a lot of different ways that I'll definitely touch on throughout um, this presentation. But the biggest thing is it's just the voice of the customer. Like it's very much a, a large bit of the data that we have about what are our customers actually wanting how uh, do they go about evaluating our uh, product and our service in different services like us, 
and then of course hearing about different competitors. Um, so that a lot of times just in general uh, helps us inform our messaging, helps us to build personas and refine those personas, um, helps us to build battle cards, um, as well as of course, change up the sales process as needed. Uh, but one uh, key way that it's actually changed our business, um, which was actually early on before I started at Indela, but I was kind of in the midst of that shift, was that we, um, in 2021, basically had three different business segments. We had an enterprise segment, a mid-market, and an SMB. And what we learned through sales win loss interviews is that those enterprise clients were buying us alongside other um, tech talent marketplaces or other ways in which to hire talent. So they'd use their internal processes. They'd use tech talent marketplaces. They'd use um, consulting firms, IT outsourcing. They'd use us alongside a lot of different options. Um, and that was just normal to them. That's just how they bought this type of service. Uh, with SMB clients, they were a bit more nuanced because they were a bit more mission critical in needing uh, talent to work on very large pieces of their business, uh, not just within departments um, like enterprises, how they have a lot of different areas that can work on different units and divisions, um, but they are more mission critical and, hey, I actually need this team to build uh, my go-to-market. I need them to build my first beta, right? They're, they're uh, very much coming to us to uh, have a longer term partnership that is critical to their success. So that kind of one to one in terms of the buying process versus the one as a as a suite um, was very different. And we had initially thought that mid market uh, was similar to enterprise. So we sold to mid market as if they were kind of in the enterprise um, phase of buying. Uh, but we noticed that mid market actually acted more like SMBs. They were still newer. They maybe had one other. Um, type of marketplace that they were using, maybe an Upwork or Fiverr. Uh, so they were a bit newer to a more managed service, but they were more similar in how we approached uh, the sales process to SMB. So how that shifted for us was really actually separating how we segmented our audience, focused on SM or enterprise, excuse me, as its own complete beast and personas, of course, within there, and then started to kind of consolidate more mid-market and SMB clients together, and then segmenting them as we saw fit within. But that was huge for again, just understanding how do we sell to different um, business segments and the sales win loss was a huge part of that. Awesome, great context, Takuya, thank you. Um, all right, let's uh, talk about the risks of not acquiring competitive intelligence. I think uh, pretty straightforward to all of us on the call here. I mean, tunnel vision, right? You're making decisions, important decisions across all those organizations without the benefit of those competitive insights. So uh, that's certainly a risk and competitors, competitors can outperform you and you may not understand why. And you know, the one on the right really resonates with me because I worked at a company years ago in my first career uh, where you know, when I came on board, they were selling a software tool uh, that they had you know, huge market share in. And then one of the competitors figured out how to uh, win against us and poach our clients. And once they you know, had, a had that figured out, they just went to town on us. So uh, I think that was a very enlightening situation about if you're not on top of the competitors and what they're doing and how they're uh, competing with you, then you know, you're at significant risk. Akuya, do you guys have uh, greater success against some competitors versus others? Yes, yes we do, but I'll definitely caveat that our competitive landscape is wild. Like if I were to put all of our competitors on a slide, there would be no white space. There'd just be so many logos. Um, and we've learned too that every time we do a sales win loss cycle, we learn about new names that we hadn't learned about right this time before. So very crowded market. Um, but there are two in particular, I won't name any names um, for purposes of focusing on Andela, um, but there's one that's a larger uh, legacy um, marketplace within this space. Uh, they're global as well very similar services, um, slightly different in terms of, you know, why we win or lose. And we have another one that's a bit of a startup um, style company that is a bit smaller, uh, much smaller than us in terms of scale, but also is very aggressive in terms of their marketing strategy, their go-to-market. Uh, we see them quite a bit in terms of our conversations with clients, so someone to watch out for. But against those two competitors, uh, what we've seen clearly when they come up in these interviews um, of why we win is for the larger competitor, we tend to win uh, because we have better talent quality, which is news to our ears to hear. Um, again, we, we're not making it up and pushing that out as messaging. We're hearing it anecdotally, specifically in quotes from um, prospects and clients. So 
that's huge um, to understand that and to know that. Uh, we also win based on our billing, which is an interesting thing to, um, to win on and to like, I guess, take pride in, in a sense. But the way that our billing is more simple than theirs, of course, eases that sales process um, and doesn't scare people away when they see a ton of line items for fees. Um, and another thing too is our, um, the type of support that we provide our talent, which is really big in our industry, um, not just transactionally wanting to um, service a team, but also making sure that you know, our network is taken care of and that they're upskilling and growing. So those are, tend to be the reasons why clients choose us over the larger competitor. For the smaller competitor, it's a bit more black and white. Uh, because we have such larger scale, it's easier for clients who want a global team or are open to teams in other time zones to choose us because we have that scale across the globe. Um, we also have more skills and capabilities uh, as a result of our scale in the network. Um, and then another interesting thing too is uh, from the perspective of also supporting talent uh, and giving them opportunities, not just for upskilling, but also to raise the amount of money that they make. Most of our talent are international. And so we tend to um, be able to provide them with higher salaries than they would make if they were starting a job in their own country. So we're able to support them, not just professionally, but personally too. So a couple of ways that we've won against specific clients or competitors, excuse me, again, the landscape is wild. So things are always hit or miss, but I would say those are um, two key examples. Yeah, and, and as it relates to that wild landscape that you referred to, I think that's relevant to uh, this concept as well as, you know, uh, Andela has had to identify your competitors and that has changed over the years, right? Um, because you're competing not necessarily only against those direct competitors, but there are uh, other types of services that you know, are competing for the same dollars. I mean, Sat Satric Solutions has that as well. We are a services firm but our biggest competitors are companies that do some of the things that we do in-house using software. So we're competing against software tools, which are not really direct competitors because they're not doing the same things that we are, but um, you know, they, they certainly get selected over us on occasion and vice versa. So talk a little bit about um, your competitive set at, at Andela and how that has changed over the years. Yeah, it's, it's definitely changed. Um... Again, it's 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 hot. It's heating up. Um, it's an easy space, I think, to enter into. But uh, before, so four years ago, I would say the industry, the higher the the freelance marketplace industry, was a bit more specific. It was freelancer.com, Guru, Upwork, Fiverr, right? Those were kind of the bigger players, and of course, everyone knew about traditional outsourcing. Um, IT outsourcing and consulting firms as ways to get technical talent that are uh, not full-time, but contract. But when, of course, the pandemic hit, we were all thrown a loop. Uh, we were all working remotely. Um, that actually accelerated the industry because now you have people who are able to work remotely. You have companies who are enabling that for their employees. And then you still have companies who need to digitize quickly. They need to move things to the cloud. Um, we have healthcare, we have manufacturing, we have uh, banking and finance moving quickly into digital spaces with fintech, right, um, and health tech, even education tech. So all these companies are needing more talent and they need them to be technical and specialized in certain areas. So the, the speed at which people were hiring only accelerated over the past four years, as, as we all know, um, part of the current economic system too. Um, but that, you know, increased our business, but also brought more competitors into the space. So I think for us, one way in which we have been able to use uh, our competitive lens, one, I believe uh, in 2020, again, before I was uh, a part of Andela, we actually used some questions during the salesman loss process to talk about, hey, how is the uh, pandemic affecting your business? How is it affecting the way you're choosing and hiring? So we were getting insight on the ground about um, the market too. Um, fast forward to last year, we were asking questions about um, what kind of services do you want to see? What kind of services, you know, if, if you were to have a conversation with Andela sales um, leadership, what would you tell them about how to improve the sales process or how to improve Andela? And what's been interesting over the last year is we've gotten a ton of different ideas, one challenges, but also ideas of how to improve um, on our service. And I think this also follows the trend of the market of companies needing to innovate, 
right? You have to innovate to stay relevant. You have to innovate to stay competitive. And so we've actually used the insights from um, what our clients are challenged with, but also the solutions they want to see or they see in the market elsewhere um, to actually help us in the product development um, part of our business. So I actually share directly those types of insights with our product development team, our product managers, our engineers, even um, as well as our UX research team. And so that kind of feeds their um, baseline discovery research. Once they have enough research, right, that validates that, hey, this is something we need to pay attention to, it's then prioritized and they go off and start to um, do different types of um, deep dives into validation and the how might we to understand how to solve for different solutions. But I think the big thing is, you know, as the market has shifted, as our business has had to evolve, we've used the win loss to ask different types of questions, gain different types of insights and make sure that we're staying competitive with what the market needs. And of course, what um, our audience is, is asking for. Yeah, thanks. And you know, I think you touch on something that's of great importance in, in a win loss program or any competitive intelligence type program is it's gotta be fluid, right? It's gotta be agile. It's gotta change with the business. And, you know, what you shared is evidence that, uh, you know, over our time with Andela, we've switched questions, changed the way, you know, the topics that we're going to focus on during discussions, because obviously your business is on, like, so we need to stay on top of that. Well, I'm going to jump through some of these pretty quickly, and you guys can have access to uh, these slides, um, but I think we are all uh, recognized there's tons of ways to collect competitive intelligence. We're talking about one primarily today, which is sales win loss, which is a, a very effective means. But of course, there's a, a lot of insights uh, that you can glean through information in the public domain. Uh, obviously, a lot of different websites. There's tools that'll scrape this information and, and put it in nice uh, dashboards and competitive battle cards for you. There's a lot of product or you know service type firms that can help you mystery shopper type things, pricing comparisons, gap analysis. You know, if you're B2C product teardowns, all the way on the right are the areas that we focus on, uh, which are, are surveys. Some of the time you can get competitive insights in even your client survey. Uh, win loss, obviously we've talked about, we'll spend a little bit more time on. Churn analysis is very, very similar to sales win loss in that it follows a very similar approach and um, uh, process. It's just different types of questions that you're asking during the interviews after a customer has decided to take their business elsewhere versus win loss when you're interviewing uh, company, you know, decision makers who have decided to use your firm or a competitor after evaluation. So very similar um, types of programs that uh, you, know, you get tremendous competitive intelligence through churn and through sales win loss. Even customer advisory boards have an opportunity to talk about uh, competitors in the competitive landscape, and then of course, you know, competitive benchmarking. So lots of uh, different opportunities here. Many of our clients are using, you know, multifaceted sort of omni-channel approach, if you will. Aquia, I know uh, we've worked with you obviously for years on Net Promoter CSAT, on sales win loss. Uh, what other things are you guys doing to uh, glean competitive intelligence? Any sources that I missed here? Yeah, so we're also working with Sotrix, um, or we have as well on the competitive benchmarking, which I think was huge for us to just see, you know, the gaps of where our brand can do better, especially in the U.S., uh, given actually the company started uh, in 2014 in Africa. So most of our presence uh, and influence was in Africa and Europe at the time. Um, so that's also huge. But in terms of, you know, kind of the ways that we also look at the competitive landscape, we do the basic things. We definitely keep alerts going to try to understand the market. All the salespeople as well for their accounts and for their territories and industries have um, specific alerts going on their um, contacts and deals. So they're kind of on the ground looking at that. Um, I think it's also really key to go to events, join webinars, be a part of you know where your customers are talking about, not just what they're doing, but where they're going next. Uh, it's really interesting to get insights there. But what's most critical for us is actually our frontline teams. So our sales reps, right? Our SDRs even, our um, service teams, our client service teams. So what they tend to do is, you know, they're on calls all the time with those um, clients and stakeholders. And we have a forum for them on Slack, just a competitive Intel channel. And they're able to drop in, ask questions, share about, you know, what they just learned from a client call. And I've really seen this work really well with our enterprise teams because they have a longer lead time and a longer, um, I guess, sales process uh, towards getting the deal signed. 
So they're able to say, hey, this client is evaluating these three different competitors. Can you, you know, help me with messaging on X, Y, and Z? And so it's actually really helped us to be able to have a two-way conversation, not just throw, you know, information at the team, but also have them uh, talk back to us and have a conversation around why is Endella uh, better? How can we win against specific competitors for specific types of clients? Um, it's also a place where we share win-loss um, analysis and not just the larger analysis, but, you know, the, the quick um, reports that we get to make sure that they're uh, top of mind for our teams, whether it's, hey, this type of client in this industry is winning because of this way, or whether it's specifically, hey, we won on this, use this tactic more. Um, so we, it's that Slack channel, I would say, and our frontline teams are one of our um, biggest wins in terms of competitive analysis, because we're able to, again, have the conversation ongoing, keep, uh, keep everything going. Yeah, we have uh, some clients, I know some people at Andela do this as well, where, you know, because we provide uh, after each interview, a summary report with our uh, takeaways, but also the entire transcript. And, you know, we're, it's intriguing to see how many of the executives are actually reading the entirety of the transcripts, which uh, I think is very telling about how much they're committed to, you know, understanding the competitive dynamic. So we're going to talk about win-loss and churn just a little bit more. Here's uh, an example of a company that we work with that's a software company, SaaS company, and over a six-month period conducting interviews and identifying the key drivers of why they win, why they lose, you can see it, it runs the gamut. There's a lot of uh, you know, primary drivers, secondary, tertiary even, uh, that you, you can understand through interviews like this. Future functionality, of course, ease of use, pricing value, time to value, reporting analytics. I mean, it varies quite a bit and it changes over time, obviously, as the company focuses in one area, um, you know, improves their product offering, advances their roadmap, uh, and then prospects are talking about different things in the interviews that we're conducting. And then, of course, the competitive dynamics as it relates to all of these dimensions are of great importance. Akwe, are there... Um, which of these drivers do you think most contribute to Andela winning and losing? Are there some that really stand out or some that aren't on the list? Yeah, I think they're definitely on the list. I think I would have, if I, if I weren't a part of the sales win-loss process at Andela, I think I would choose other ones. But because of the insights we have, like I'm speaking to these two, but time to value for us is huge. Like I said, we have too many competitors. Uh, what we learned, which is so basic, is that we win when we're fast, we lose when we're slow. And that clearly means if we're too long in the process of getting the right match for a client's needs um, in terms of talent, a client can just turn around and go, okay, I'll go to this, this other list and then I'll go to the next and then the next, right? They have a complete Rolodex of other companies to go to. So we have to make sure that the time to value sticks. Um, with that insight, we found out and dug a bit deeper uh, with the sales win loss. And we're able to find out that the biggest hurdle in time to value for us was actually the MSA contract signing process, mostly for our enterprise, but the contract signing process was taking too long. It was, we, people were held up, prospects were held up way too long in that phase. So what we did um, last year uh, was that we actually took a few steps. Of course, it wasn't just the marketing team that was a part of making these changes, but the sales team actually strategized on which parts can we, <laughs> which parts can we actually take out or which parts can we uh, speed up. And so we took a few steps out of that process and our time to value has increased. And so a lot of more of our enterprise um, contracts are being signed much quick, much more quickly. Um, and they're able to move then to the next step in the process of finding the right talent for their needs. Um, one that's completely underrated that I love because Indela is a social mission focused company is the roadmap and vision. And the reason why it's huge is not just because it feels good to talk about your company's mission, or it feels good to, you know, to have that be a part of the sales process. But again, a part of one of the, a few anecdotal um, specific reasons why this is important is that clients who may have even lost, right? They weren't even wins. They were losses actually said, Hey, the reason why I came back and engaged with Endela is because of the mission. I remember the mission and it was top of mind. So for us, you know, we don't want to puppet it too much and have that be our whole story, but we also don't want to forget about it because we know that when we have it as a part of the sales process, it's memorable and it sticks. Um, and so the SDRs, I'm sure, uh, would, would sing praises about the fact that, you know, their efforts um, six months down the line, even a year down the line, right, were 
um, completed because the mission and vision um, were well sold and stuck with the prospects. So those two are important there. There's probably more we're forgetting, but I think these are the core um, drivers for sure. Yeah, that's great. I remember uh, you guys got a lot of publicity and press early on uh, about Andela's mission and uh, some prominent investors also. Uh, so that uh, certainly helped. So let's dig in a little bit. Um, if you have a win-loss program, hopefully some tips uh, here that you may be able to take away to improve it. If you're looking to stand one up, then I think um, you know these are some things you certainly want to think about. Uh, first and foremost, you can't interview everybody, right? You're not going to interview every win or every loss. So I'm thinking about you know your methodology and who you identify as the best candidates to interview. With many of our clients, it's you know those that are making it far along in the sales cycle, and then um, you know the ones that are the most competitive. Those usually provide the most valuable insights, but there are you know a lot of variation depending on uh, the client as far as what they want to. Uh, here and what they want to learn. Um, some of our clients like to get sort of 50% wins, 50% losses. Some of them like to focus exclusively on losses. You know, we try to guide them away from that, but uh, you know, they want to know what they are doing wrong and what they can do better. So, you know, really thinking about who are the right targets and who are the right individuals at those targets uh, to uh, interview. And then you got to find someone who will conduct these interviews. Now, this is something that I think oftentimes is overlooked. It takes a certain kind of person with a, a experience to be able to maximize the value of these interviews. Someone who's independent and objective, so it should not be the salesperson. Uh, seasoned and professional, so they know how to navigate these important discussions, know how to listen, uh, active listening, uh, keep things uh, sort of semi-structured, but not overly structured. Uh, know when to probe, know when to follow on, sort of ask additional questions so you dig deeper, almost like a mini root cause type discussion, right, when you hear something. So, you know, finding the right person and having them uh, conduct these interviews properly is like one of the most significant uh, factors in whether this is going to be a, a successful program or not. Uh, thinking about what your objectives are, as we touched on a moment ago, they change from period to period. So this helps inform what's the sort of questionnaire that you're gonna use, the topics of conversation that you want to understand. Uh, and then, you know, when you're conducting the interview, as I mentioned, you know, you wanna build that rapport, you wanna remain agile, you know, respect silence. You don't need to be talking uh, nearly as much as hopefully the interviewee, um, you know, listen for cues and, and probe. And then we also record the interviews. You know, we're in Arizona, so we're a one party state, you know, look at your laws of your local, uh, you know, where you live, but uh, we're able to record the interviews and, and oftentimes we will uh, get permission to do so, uh, but that helps you, you know, really engage and, and listen uh, more closely so that you can focus on the conversation as opposed to scrambling to take notes. Uh, and then once you have the interviews conducted, you know, summarize them and socialize them as we've talked about that Andela does very well in a variety of ways, you know, make sure you're sharing and discussing uh, this internally and importantly acting on the themes. Uh, and that's where I'd like to get your input, Aquaria. And, you know, I think the team would benefit from understanding how does Andela uh, act on the, th the themes, the findings? You touched on a little bit of this already, but I mean, do you have sort of quasi formal process uh, or, um, you know, what are you doing to make sure that this is uh, shared and, and thought about in the decision making? Yeah. And if anyone has more. Um, specific questions about this, happy to answer. But I think there are two kind of main ways that are formal and that our team expects of this process for the insights. So as you had mentioned before, Evan, Sautrix actually does a great job of um, summarizing each interview. So summarizing the transcript and then also has a summary up top of, you know, the different reasons why uh, the drivers and also why it was a win, why it was a loss um, and key uh, quotes. So Actually on the fly, I send those transcripts directly to the sales rep. I make sure that they, because especially in a loss or a win situation where uh, a sales process is long, it could actually be that that insight from that conversation was weeks ago um, or even last week, but things may have already changed. Um, so giving them that information to go ahead and uh, act on, talk to the client if they need to, um, or talk to the prospect if they need to, or just insight for how they then reach back out to the prospect in six months, three months um, has been hugely helpful. And 
funny enough, this week, actually yesterday, one of our salespeople reached out, was like, hey, you sent a salesman loss report to me last week. And me and my boss just talked about it. Can we get on a call? So literally after this call, I'm chatting with one of our sales reps about um, a recent uh, loss that will soon be a win. We have to strategize some things uh, to push it over the line. Um, another way we do this, of course, is to share it more broadly. And from a product marketing perspective, uh, I'm always very sensitive to the audience that I'm talking to and the type of information that it's most relevant to them. So what I try to do with any of these reports is not just say, hey, anyone, here is the information. Uh, sales, for the most part, can ingest that type of information and all of it because it's very specific to the sales process. But I actually work directly with my Sotrix rep to get different data splits and to get different types of information that speak to different departments. So yes, sales can have the whole thing, maybe a summary or the executive summary and be good. But our product team, we have to dive a bit deeper into some of the quotes or, hey, what, what were the specific features that were mentioned? Let's dig into those and how that contributed to losses. We've done that for our product team. For marketing teams, how did you hear about Endella, right? In what ways? Was it cold calls? Was it email outreach? Was it um, through a banner ad, right? So we want to make sure that those teams are each getting the right type of information. And so we do a bit of due diligence. It takes a bit of time to get the um, analysis out, but that due diligence helps our teams ingest the information and actually take action on it. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, you know, the next slide actually has uh, a lot on it and it's, it's basically some questions that you can consider asking in your win-loss interviews. If you wanna hit me up, I'm happy to share this or others, but you know, basically a lot of uh, you know, quasi open-ended questions that help you to gain an understanding about every step in the sales process uh, and what the decision makers thoughts were about you know, every aspect of your company versus the other companies being considered. So a lot here, uh, we'll usually schedule 30 minute interviews uh, with the target. Uh, you can't always get to everything on the list of questions or topics, but um, you know, certainly uh, 30 minutes is ample time to get you know, a tremendous amount of detail. And you know, just some final uh, do's and don'ts. So you know, we believe, as we've talked about, create you know, create that transcript and and share that internally. You can start establishing themes. Um, you know, using sort of a code book uh, that uh, you know usually comes about after half a dozen or you know up to ten interviews. You start hearing some similar concepts that have been shared, and you can start looking at those themes, which, as Aquia mentioned are shared similarly to the individual reports, right? Is the deep dive analysis. Um, you know, we talked about uh, sharing this internally for the purposes of training or replicating success, offer kudos to appropriate people. Those are all good practices. Uh, and then, you know, refine as needed. Uh, things to watch out for is, you know, sometimes uh, we have to press our clients surprisingly to distribute and, you know, make available these findings. So don't keep it to yourself. Um, you know, it's tough sometimes, uh, you know, you're hearing things that you don't necessarily agree with, but, you know, as we say, perception is reality. So try not to negate what you're hearing. Um, you know, definitely not used for scolding anybody. Uh, I worked in a company, we weren't, uh, they weren't a client, but, you know, when the CEO heard some things about a loss, he would run and yell at the salesperson, which obviously isn't the most effective needs of, of motivating anybody. So uh, try not to embarrass or scold. And we'll, we'll actually redact some statements in the transcript if it's actually, you know, maybe potentially embarrassing to the salesperson. So that's something you consider as well is you don't have to share it in its entirety because if other people are gonna see it, um, you know, that sort of defeats the purpose and they might not be so inclined to want their targets interviewing, uh, interview going forward. Uh, and then, you know, generally you don't use this type of feedback outside the organization. It's a one-to-one -one conversation. It's meant for your company only. Um, and so, you know, keeping it that way and honoring uh, the expectations of the target is important. Aquia, anything on either side of the ledger here that you want to highlight? Yeah, I think all of these are very important, especially keeping the feedback, to, uh, not keeping the feedback to yourself, excuse me. But I can't harp or agree more uh, 100%, 100% about not embarrassing your salespeople, not scolding them, right? This should, even if it's in a loss situation, even if the client was very open or the prospect was very open and said a lot of things um, that weren't great, I think these should always be used as learning 
um, and growth opportunities. They should not be used to put anyone down or diminish the work that was done. Um, I think in, in encouraging um, good performance and, and, and positive aspects here, you help to grow the platform and the, the process of salesman loss. Last thing I'll say is when it comes to stakeholders, and I know we're talking about the afterwards process, but you might find that, so again, if, if someone's really plugged into the value of salesman loss, you will have more people wanting this data. And I think what's very cr crucial, especially uh, for myself, I'm working in, under a product team. So in a product department as a product marketing manager, but our, this insight is most helpful, as I said, in its totality to our sales team. So under the revenue organization and without their inputs, without revenue and sales enablement, um, without their inputs on the questions, the process, the insights moving, things will not move forward. So you need those stakeholders from the, from the start, the key stakeholders, not everyone, just the key stakeholders to make sure their inputs are heard, what's important to them, what do they wanna ask and know, uh, so that you're not missing anything when it comes to the end analysis. And then it's also the most rich information you can get. Yeah, it's a great point. You don't want uh, folks being obstacles because you know they're not, they haven't bought into the program, right? So it's very careful how you message a lot of this. Awesome, thank you, Aquia. You know, just some final uh, thoughts. Um, you know, doing it yourself. A lot of companies do it very successfully internally. Uh, you know, we talked about some of the important ingredients before, but you know, just as a final reminder, um, you know, watch out because there are ways where confirmation bias comes into play, or you're analyzing data that isn't really representative, or you're not interviewing the right people, and they're forgetting only a sliver of the truth. So, uh, and then a lot of programs that we see sort of do the stop and start thing, right? So, um, you know, that, uh, you know, runs uh, a counter to, you know, an on the success of an ongoing program, which I think, you know, you need to keep your finger on the pulse. So uh, the program needs to run on an ongoing basis in most cases. So just some things to think about uh, if you're going to run this internally. And that's all we have for you today. Um, I think, um, you know, Quia, thank you so much for contributing and really talking through where the rubber meets the road. Uh, I know uh, only a, a handful of people on, but any questions, any comments, any experiences you guys want to share, or if not, we can wrap it up. Thank you, Aaron and, and, and Aquia. Very, very insightful conversation. And, and you know, we'll post the, 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 the recording. Uh, we'll, I'll, I'll try to fix it. <laughs> Take out the minutes. technical. Yeah. Um, yeah, happens all the time. But uh, thank you both for for sharing. Um, any questions out there? No, we can wrap it up. This was fantastic. Thank you. This was uh, a great presentation. Okay, I'd love to find out if you're still hiring in Af Africa. I might be able to send some people your way as BDRs. By the way. Yes, we definitely still are. Our network is okay. open completely. So yeah, let's connect. Uh, all right, absolutely. I'll hit you up on LinkedIn. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And Aquia, thanks again. Really appreciate you carving out some time to talk about this. Very helpful. Yes. Yes. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to share all this. And this was an honor. So I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.